everyone, welcome to the Learn the Tech Show number number 17 for June 7, 2016. And uh, today we're going to talk about a little bit of the technology and history of television. Uh, of course, all the subjects on the show are uh, subjects that are submitted by you, the viewer. And uh, my name is Jill, and I'm located in Montreal, Canada. And of course, this is a one hour show every Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's 2200 hours universal time. Hope you enjoy today's show. It's, you know, there's a very complex thing about television. There's a lot of steps, there's a lot of things, but we're going to focus on some of the important moments of television and uh, especially the technology used in television and why we are today where we are. You know, I mean, uh, just look at, say you go back in the 1960s and you show people from the 1960s a television like this, that is, you know, this tin, and they look at it, color and everything, and they're like, wow, what is that? That's so future. And, uh, you know, television is something that changed the world. Radio changed the world because it let people communicate from, you know, different areas with wireless stuff. But television changed the world in another way. Not only did we know and hear what was happening somewhere, we had images. For the first time, we could see things that are happening somewhere else. You know, today we take for granted that side of television, the possibility of seeing live what's happening at the other side of the world, um, something which was incredible back uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So uh, we're going to take a look a little bit of television and stuff and how it changes its technology with time. But how uh, surprising that technology uh, used behind television. So here's an example of a uh, first type of TV set that was made in the early 1900s. Now, TV isn't something new in 1905, 1910, in the sense that as early as 1880 or around, there are people thinking about how we can send images uh, from one place to another and how to display images with devices. How can we take an image of someone and display it with a device? So we got different devices, they got different ideas. Even in the 1800s, as we start to see that wireless technology exists and that wireless is possible to send radio signals, somebody's saying, hey, maybe we can send pictures and moving pictures and stuff like that. So they you know, start making these things. Now the first ideas of TV the technology behind it are basically mechanical. It's mechanical television. So basically, you see here, somebody's there, and with all these mechanical parts, uh, you know, spinning disks, mirrors, they're able to create an image on a screen. Now, the thing is, these things work, but they're at the very basics of, you know, displaying any images. The first, basically the first motion picture or we could say moving picture television or what will resemble kind of a television set is by this guy. This guy is Charles Francis uh, Jenkins and on the 1st of December 1923 he shows to a little group of friends, look, I'm using a device that can display moving silhouettes of people. And it takes two years, not until, until 1925. And this is an excerpt from a magazine, a popular radio magazine that shows uh, his interest here. Now, He's showing a transmitter that he can use to send moving images and he's showing it to a crowd and the crowd is amazed at wow wirelessly sending out moving pictures this is pretty amazing and we're far we're in 1925 so we're in the early 20th century 
There's, you know, all sorts of things. Radio is starting to get to some point interesting where people are saying, hey, this is cool. I can listen to stations broadcasting news and everything. Now, there's, we're very far from the home here. We're still at the experimental stage of broadcasting moving images. Once again, the technology used behind this is mostly spinning disks, mirrors, and trying to transfer that into a, a wireless system of radio signals that can be decoded. But it's all mechanical. The transmission is mechanical to the radio signal. And the reception is mechanical from the radio signal. So it's very complex because it's really uh, moving parts. Uh, it's not only moving parts, it's also very noisy. These devices with the spinning discs and everything make a lot of noise. And uh, that's the first thing that people notice beyond the fact that, wow, this is cool. I see this moving picture coming from somewhere else. But there's a lot of noise created by the devices themselves. We get to uh, a point where basically uh, we have the first, eventually, the first television station ever, uh, W2XB. It's owned by General Electric and it's, and it's connected in New York. And this is the first ever TV station to be set up. First ever. And that is in 1928. And um, basically, there's not a lot of people that have TV sets. Actually, nobody has a TV set back in 1928. And uh, even they had, so it's kind of complicated. But, you know, it's experimental television sending out signals. What's interesting, though, is that even though the first station is broadcast here in 1928, what we don't know is that in the USSR, they are more advanced. In the USSR... There's a guy called Leon Terimin that actually is able to broadcast moving pictures at a higher resolution because this is extremely low resolution. You know, today we're talking about like a TV like this that has a resolution that goes up to 1920 pixels. Think about it, okay? 1920 pixels. This broadcast is something like 60 lines 70 lines it's a small little thing it's you know just being the minimum that is possible to send well while they are broadcasting around 60 lines the soviets at the same time are now broadcasting 110 lines and even 120 lines picture is twice as big twice as much resolution. So this Soviet Union on its side, and we don't hear a lot about that because as, as Westerners, we hear a lot, especially back then when you know the USSR is still kind of that weird uh, country that a lot of people don't really know much about. What's happening there, uh, we don't really hear much about it here, but there are some things that's interesting. For example, they are, the ones who will establish the first real big standard of television, which is the 625 lines of te television that, I mean, that was the norm for TV in, uh, in the world for, you know, decades. Uh, so it's kind of interesting when you look at it. So first ever TV station to broadcast over the air is W2XB. Now, maybe someone on their YouTube channel is going to say, nah, 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 I've read somewhere that, you know, everybody wants to claim the first TV station. Everybody wants to claim something. You know, here in Montreal, for a long time, there was claimed that CFCF 600 medium wave AM was the first ever radio station in North America. Now, is that true? Not really sure, because when I read different books, there's different stations that are the first ever stations in North America. But, you know, all of them are pretty close, so we can say that. So we move on, and what really starts changing the world 
with television and what will help people, ordinary people have TV is the invention of the cathode ray tube. Now, two versions of the cathode ray tube will happen. One with what we called a cold uh, diode and the one with the hot uh, diode. And basically, this will redefine forever television. When electronics start to show up and tubes exist, and now we have full electronic stuff, we have the cathode ray tube. And the cathode ray tube is uh, invented in 1897. The first idea of a cathode ray tube is in 1897. And I'm not sure that back then they really are sure what they will do with it and that it will be used for such a long time. Cathode ray tubes are still used today by millions of computer monitors, of TV sets, old TV sets. And they, as you see, will live out a long, long time. So we have this uh, guy called Ferdinand Brown. He's a German guy. He invents this. And that's why at first the CRT, or the cathode ray tube, is actually called the Brown tube because of the inventor. So why does this change forever what we do with tele television? Well, it's simple. It's because this is, first of all, fully electronic, no moving parts. And with the use of deflection plates of very, very strong magnets and with what we call a um, electron gun, sounds like war, but it's not war, You're, they're able to send electrons into a surface here that has some kind of fluorescent coating. Uh, for most TVs and monitors today, it's uh, phosphorus, which is a, when it hit by an electron, it lights up. Of course, the first electron uh, or CRTs are black and white because we're not talking about color yet because it's more complex to create color. So only one electron beam creating patterns on a screen here and with varying electric currents, it will simply make the electron move. So for example, uh, when you apply current, there's of course magnetic forces that are applied and the electron because of the magnetic forces is deviated by that force. So when you carefully calculate how much deviation you can give an electron, it will of course uh, hit the screen, the, the screen at a specific point and if you use it well, well, you know where exactly you want to pinpoint everything. And of course, by using scanning technology where the electron beam moves all the time, you create images. And that is the fundamental thing that will change forever. The fact that everybody can now get a television. So the first television set will start to appear because of this. Thing is, back then, the electron or the CRTs are small because one of the biggest problems with a CRT is that the tube inside needs to be completely, completely removed from air. So it means that there's a vacuum in here and a very big vacuum because if there's air, the electrons can hit an air particle instead of hitting the front and that will deviate the electron, it won't work. So they have to create as good a vacuum as they can in here for it to work well. So at the beginning, they make these tubes, but the problem is making the vacuum without the tubes exploding or imploding is kind of complicated. So they can't make really big tubes. So first TV sets have very small screens because that's the way they can do it. As they change the shape and change the way they do these, eventually they'll get big screens. And you know, you'll, you've all seen CRTs with 30 and 40 inches screens. They are heavy as hell, why? Because they have 
you know, very, very thick um, glass. And that's why, you know, the good old TVs, those, they, they weigh so much because very thick glass in order to prevent implosion, they have to withstand the air pressure around it in order to not implode. So that's why it's so heavy. It's because these things are really thick. And as we go through, well, that changes the technology. But what's amazing about the electron tube is the fact that it dominates for such a long time. As soon as the electron, uh, the, the CRT is, the cathode ray tube is actually invented, when the first TV come out, that technology will go through for ages with some modifications, slight modifications, uh, making things a little better. Uh, Sony inventing the Trinitron, which does a different type of scanning in the electrons. And that technology helps because the first ones, you see how long this one is? This is the, the first ones are like that. They're very long because that's how they do it. But as time goes by and as different technologies are, of course, um, used, basically, the electron tube will be shrunk. So the TV doesn't have to be as far back and as big as the models before, but there's still a minimum. There's still a distance that they just can't cross. So TVs stay big, basically. But it's amazing how for such a long time, this doesn't change. This doesn't change through the, you know, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. We're still on cathode ray tubes. In the 90s, that's where things slowly change, and we'll, we'll see why a little bit. Now, television is, of course, very expensive in the... Um, in the 1950s. And um, one of the first things that we see is that television in the 1950s, uh, what brings the resolution and brings more pixels is, like I stated a little earlier, that Russian, uh, the, the USSR, they actually introduce in 1944 a 625 line, 25 line standard. And at first, they are the only ones that are using it. But at the late 40s, it's agreed upon that all TV sets, all the standard TVs will have the possibility to use the 625 line system. And that 625 line system is another thing that stayed for a long time. Because TV in the 60s, in the 70s, and the 80s, they still have the same resolution. Nothing changed from the 1950s up to, 19, up to the 90s until we invented this, the HDTV standard, basically. So that's pretty amazing when you think that there's, they, they, it, you know, nothing happened. And it's funny because although TVs have to stay in the same standard, in the 80s and in the 90s, we start getting computer monitors. And computer monitors are basically cathode ray tubes. They're TVs. They're TVs, but they're specialized for computers. Computers display very precise text and points and, you know, all sorts of little details. So we need something. The first, of course, the first computers plug in on TVs. But as we need more resolution, because we need better images from computers, uh, we invent the computer monitor. And the computer monitor is a TV. And the funny thing is, the computer monitor's resolution got up as time went by. In the 90s, we went to very high resolutions on these um, same, basically it's the same technology as TV. But instead of t TV stayed at 625 lines through the 90s, Computer monitors went into, you know, 1,024 lines and more. And it's surprising that they didn't apply the HD standard at that point to TVs because there was a possibility TVs could have been 
much more precise, even with the cathode ray tube that they've used. So it's pretty interesting for that. Now, as we go through 1950s, there's a lot, you know, TVs are small and TVs are expensive. Here you see it's $60 less than the previous model. So imagine the price of those models. They were like $200, $300, which means for 1950, 300 bucks is a lot of money. 300 bucks in 1950 is, you know, something like probably three, four thousand dollars today, which would be expensive for a TV. Um, basically, they are changing the world. People are sitting down and they are enjoying shows, TV shows, you know, all sorts of new things I'd never seen before. Uh, Ed Sullivan show and everything and, re, you know, having all sorts of TV shows, they gather around the TV. This is a, a, a nice image that I found that I was like, wow, this is cool everybody around the TV. You know, we don't see that as much today. We do, we still do see today people around their TV. But, um, you know, this is a nice picture because it does represent pretty much what was so cool back then. And look at how small the screen here is when you compare it to the people here. Because back then, like I said, creating cathode ray tubes big enough that work well are, is very difficult because they tend to implode. And by the way, one of the dangers of the TVs of that era is that a lot of people had implosions of the TV screen on their TVs because the technology to create those were still brand new. We, we knew we had to do a, a vacuum and that would create enormous pressure on the screen itself. But the, you know, the technology used to create these screens was still wondering what's the best shape, how should we do it so that it could withstand that pressure. So it didn't take much sometimes to break a screen on a TV back then. Uh, and uh, it took a long time before new technologies and also adding because those were made mostly of uh, glass and lead. But at some point, they were showing how to, uh, they were actually increasing the resistance of these by adding more types of uh, impurities in the glass. So by adding some different stuff in the glass, they found out how to make the glass more resistant. That's when TV actually started getting bigger. When they started knowing how to make these cathode ray tubes, basically things started getting bigger and bigger all the time because now they could make resistant screens. And, you know, if you look today, um, take a 30-inch a huge CRT screen. Uh, you can drop it on the floor. It won't even crack. It's amazingly solid. And, um, you know, that is thanks to all the technology used to improve upon the design of that. Now, color TV. Color TV is the second step where technology advances with television. And color TV is introduced pretty early. You know, color TV, as soon as TV starts, you know, they're starting to show how to make, you know, moving images and stuff. Color TV is already in the process. And about a year or two after the first electronic black and white TVs, there's already color TV possibilities. But the technology is too expensive. It's very complex to make. It doesn't take on for a while. And it's not until the 50s and even 60s that color TV slowly become standard in the homes. Also, all the, you know, think of all the, the, the TV stations. They have to change everything, all the technology in their studios, like they had to do for HDTV, by the way. And all that technology has to be changed in order to make color television. And uh, of course, it introduces standards, you know, like PAL and NTSC, uh, and of course, there's SICAM, there's all sorts of different um, uh, standards 
for broadcasting. So color TV comes um, to pretty much everybody. And the major difference, what makes color TV possible is that the same cathode ray tube that I shown you earlier that's sending an electron beam, instead of having one electron beam, it has three. And now they have three electron beams and the screen, the front of the screen, where it hits and lights up the phosphorus um, you know, on the screen, is divided into little cells with three different colors. So each beam has to be extremely precise and hit exactly the color that it is intended to. So that mix of the three colors can make all the colors you ever want on your TV screen. So, you know, there's advancements, color TV. We're still in the same standard of the number of lines uh, for that. So it doesn't change the resolution or anything. It's just that everybody's now in color instead of being, um, you know, black and white. Here we have a guy that's called Maurice Leblanc. And this guy in 1880 is actually one of the first ever to think of color TV. Imagine, this is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, so, you know, you see how it's just amazing how some of the things that we had and we have today have started much earlier than pretty everybody thinks about. You know, uh, when we think of TV, we think of 1950s. We don't think that in 1880, 1890, 1900, there's somebody working on something that's probably a TV. So kind of mind boggling. And of course, as the TVs um, slowly get to your home, different models appear. This is 1960 Philco uh, TVs with color. Screens getting bigger, you know, first TVs are 10 inch, 8 inch, 10 inch, 11 inch. And we're starting to move into the 20 inches and more and more. So that's, you know, thanks to the advance of technology. So we go into the 80s. We're still in color TV. There's improvements, of course, because if you notice with the electronic improvements, you notice that in 1970 color TV, isn't the same, doesn't have the same brightness, the same colors, the same precision as a 1980s color TV. That's because we're refining how the electrons are sent on the screen. We're refining the cathode ray tube. Uh, like I said, Sony Trinitron is one of the, the major players here where it changes the way that uh, we're sending images. It uses uh, kind of what's called a mask, which is kind of a um, sheet of aluminum with millions of little tiny holes and that the electrons go through. And that mask actually improves on the design of the cathode ray tube to make pictures even more clear, even more precise. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of little advancements uh, in here. And of course, the computer monitor shares basically the same technology as a CRT. One of the funny things that I remember in the nine, late 90s, early 2000s, where you know everybody's still on their cathode ray TVs, and there's really no HD TV shows yet, is people asking me, well, oh, when I look at a movie on my computer screen, it's ugly. That means the computer screen is not, you know, resolution is not good. It means the computer screen is not as good as a TV. And they were surprised because I always would say, no, it's the other way around. It's actually that your TV shows or movies that you have were created for standard definition. And standard definition means that it has 625 lines. You're on a computer monitor that now can display thousands of pixels, thousands of lines. So when you bloat it out, it's actually not nice because you're watching 
something that doesn't have the definition of your computer monitor. So you could say that the first HD TVs were computer monitors, basically. So we're in the 90s. And in the 90s, we get to a point where HD TVs start you know, to, uh, it's, it's first Japanese. In 1990, um, the first Japanese uh, start really looking seriously at HD TV. Now, it goes back a long way. HD TV, the first idea of HD TV comes from Japan. And it is talked about in 1980. But we're still very far from it because we have to create standards. We have to understand how to broadcast such a signal. Because one of the things that's different with HD and standard definition is the bandwidth, the quantity or the how big the signal is when you're using radio waves. The more information you send, the bigger that signal looks. And so it takes more space in the radio spectrum. So they have to check out how to do that and how to uh, cope with the bandwidth of the radio signal when they're sending out an image. And of course, there's different things that are coming. But the thing is, is that the TVs are slowly getting computerized. So in the 80s, we start seeing TVs that advertise like, oh, we're using, uh, you know, uh, chips. We're using integrated chips to or ICs in the TV. And, you know, look, it's replacing the transistor. And that opens up another era where TVs slowly get microprocessors. So that means they're turning the TV into a computer, which means processing power of the TV is getting interesting. And because of the processing power also means you can use compression, you can use different methods to take that huge signal and finally kind of, you know, using WinZip on a TV signal. So in the 90s, we start seeing the first standards of HDTV. It's in the 90s that the first HDTV appear. And they are, of course, once again, the first, first HDTVs are CRTs. There's, once again, cathode ray tube technology. And so cathode ray tube technology uses the HD standard. And depending on the standard that you have, a certain number of lines are defined, 720 or 1,080, defining 720p, 1080p. But we're at the verge of actually a very, very big revolution when we are on HD TVs. And it's the fact that we have a new thing called liquid crystal displays. Now, liquid crystal is not something new when the HD TVs start. Uh, liquid crystals are something that has been since the 70s. And it was at first very expensive, and then it was coming down. Liquid crystals were used in different things like you know, pocket calculators. Uh, and basically what a liquid crystal is, it's simply a um, kind of a um, semi-liquid crystal that changes its state depending on the amount of electricity that flows through it. So you can have it like full on or full off or in the middle. That's why you can have different, um, you know, uh, variations like here and the black and the white and the blue and everything is because you can just ask that liquid crystal to change slightly. So basically what it does is the liquid crystal doesn't light up itself. And what it does is reflect the light. So basically, like on a TV like this, you have side um, some LEDs on the side that's sending light through the TV. And it's the panel itself, the way that it's made, that light goes through well. And what happens is the liquid crystals here on the screen are changing depending on the amount of electricity that's flowing through, X, through each um, pixel. 
So that is something that has been around for a while, but it's the first time that it becomes cheap enough because liquid crystal displays are difficult to make and they're very expensive. But we get to a point where liquid crystal displays will change forever what we have as TVs. The first HD TVs are CRTs, but the next generation of HD TVs are the first to be liquid crystal displays. So what happens? The TV shrinks in size suddenly because liquid crystals are uh, something that is very small. One of the technologies used also, plasma. Plasma is one of the first technologies used in much smaller TV. Plasma TVs typically have these little um, kind of, you know, the screen is made of very small capsules that contain gas that will, of course, change depending, once again, on the electrostatic charge and the um, electricity flowing through it. So that's another technology that's used. So for a while, plasmas and LCDs are ne you know, next to each other in the technology of TV, but the plasma gets a little hedge for a while because it costs less to, to make. Uh, plasmas have in their properties also, and a lot of people will say, I prefer a plasma TV for the picture than I did my LCD, for example. And a lot of you know fanatics of HDTV will say, oh man, I want to have my good old plasma TV instead of an LCD or a LED TV and so on. Well, LED TVs are LCDs and we'll talk a little more about that. So we start getting TVs that, you know, instead of being those big CRTs, you know, they're maybe this thick, which is much better basically than having uh, a, a good old CRT that's huge and pay, weighs, you know, two tens. These are more lightweight in the design, the way they are made. So they also help out here in the, uh, the display basically. So we've got plasma TVs, we've got, you know, uh, LCD, and we have TVs that also have computer chips now, which means that the TV can uh, use these signals and uh, use the compressions necessary to create the HD pictures that we see. So the TVs get smarter, and that's why we call smart TVs because now they're even computers with apps, which is pretty cool. So LCD changes the world, plasma changes the world, and we get to a point where uh, basically uh, we get to certain standards of what HD is. What is actually the standards of HD? So let's take a look here. This is a PAL. Now this PAL is European. Here in North America, we were on NTSC, which is not far from these numbers, but not exactly that size. But for the purpose of this uh, discussion, let's just think about the fact that this is what a resolution would look like on my TV from an old program or an old show. This is how big on pixels that show was because that was the number of pixels on 80s, 70s and 80s color TVs. Then we invented the first wave of HD. First wave of HD is this. This is 720p by 1280, uh, sorry, the other way around, 1280 by 720. So it means there's 1,280 pixels Horizontal, 720 pixels vertical. So this is the first HD standard. That's the one that's created first. It's like, okay, this is the minimum we need to have HD. For example, what you're watching now, my stream that I'm broadcasting with my webcam is a stream that is in 720p HD. This is the resolution that I'm sending out to you right now eventually it's going to change because eventually I'll buy something new and 
I'll have 1080p resolution, which will be even better. But remember that the more you have pixels, the more information you're sending out. So that's also something you have to check for. It's very important. And finally, the high HD standard basically is settled at 1080p. That's 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels, which is basically, even though it doesn't take the full screen here, um, this TV has 1920 by 1080. And that's what the computer that I have plugged in actually gives my TV in resolution. So that's what we call the real HD standard. This is the top of the line of HD. Now, all of that is possible by another thing. The fact that electronics is getting smaller and smaller and smaller all the time. You know, electronic transistors and every little electronic parts get small. And one of the things is that every pixel you see on my screen here right now is controlled by a transistor. So every little pixel, so think about it. There's 1,080 pixels up, down. There's 1,920 here. So each of these little dots that is very, very small is controlled by a transistor. And even more than one. It is controlled by three transistors because it has three colors to create the color scheme of your screen here. So there's millions of transistors in my screen here, millions. And the reason that it can be possible is thanks to the fact that electronics gotten so small that you can put millions of transistors here and you can even put billions of transistors in a screen this size by using the smallest transistors we have, which means you can increase even more. And that's where we're getting for the future. Of course, all sorts of technologies have, are added to uh, TVs. You know, there's smart TV stuff, so there are apps. You can add apps. Uh, you can have all sorts of, like, you know, computer style stuff on the TVs because they become computers. Uh, Wi-Fi, this TV is connected. So this TV is connected to my Wi-Fi network. Uh, so it becomes kind of a computer with a big screen. And you can go on the internet. You can watch Netflix. You can go to YouTube. Uh, you can share stuff over your wireless network. So it's pretty cool for that. And um, you know these TVs get more advanced because they're becoming computers. You know, And I'm still surprised. And one thing that is uh, what I I, I, I wonder, how come we still don't have a 50-inch TV that's basically just a computer? That is still baffling to me. I would probably be happy to buy a 50 or 60-inch TV that would have an Intel processor, RAM, SSD uh, hard drive, and you know, you just use this wireless keyboard, basically have the wireless keyboard uh, connected and you're on, basically you're on doing whatever you want. It's a computer. Uh, I'm very, very much surprised that it's not happening yet. You know, we have computerized TVs that have haps. We have computerized TVs that uh, do a lot of stuff, but yet we're not, it's not a computer. And I'm, I, I don't understand why nobody made one of those. Uh, it seems manufacturers are kind of not understanding. Maybe it'd be cool to have just a computer TV. TV when you want to watch your shows, TV when you want to view whatever movie with the computer technology, not the crappy experience that we're having right now. Because right now, oh, yeah, we have my Samsung TV goes on the web. It has a browser, and it's like, yeah, it's crappy experience. It's totally crappy. Uh, you know, they would pay a basic Windows license, for example, and why not have Windows 10 on a 50-inch TV? I like that. Instead of having that big, huge box there that actually is the computer connected to this screen, uh, that'd be cool. That'd be really cool. So, uh, hey, any manufacturers out there, 
Why not? What's the future of television? Um, we're talking a lot about the future of TV. You know, every time we change our standards, you got to understand that there are two players that need to change their standards. Uh, and both of them are not in a big hurry to change the standards. So the first one is the TV studio. So every TV studio, every movie studio, every TV station needs to change the cameras, needs to change all the technology to use in order to broadcast in a new format. So when HD arrived, uh, basically, the only way that the governments can see that we need to push this thing is by simply saying, okay, here's a date where everybody needs to be in HD. So you can imagine TV stations, TV studios needs to spend hundreds of millions of dollars changing all the, the equipment, the cameras, everything. You need better lighting. You need better way of doing things because HD means uh, you see more details on what's happening. Also, uh, you, the viewer, us, you know, we've just moved the, revolu the, the, re the, the, the revolution of HDTV. Everybody was happy. It was like, oh, I've got an HDTV. And it takes time. There are still millions, if not billions, of good old CRT TVs out there. I go to clients for computers and see their old technology still there. So when you think about it, uh, we're not really not all gone to HD yet. And so HD technology prices are going down. Of course, it's making people buy TVs because the prices are going lower, lower, and lower all the time. But we're already talking about 4K, which is the next standard. This is what we call Ultra HD. This is better in um, image quality because if we look at our chart, now this one's a little small compared to the other one, a bit bigger, so here we go. So regular, as we call DVD, regular standard was 480 720 we got into 720p then we got into 1080p 1920 but 1080 this look at how huge the next generation is compared to even our hd that there's actually right now ultra hd or what's called 4k why is it called 4k it's simply for the number of pixel we are at close to 4000 pixel resolution it's called 4k and the resolution here is 2160 by 3840 now that is a huge advance in the number of pixels and we're talking about you know enhanced color enhance everything but yet here's the thing Nobody, not everybody still moved to HD yet. We're still in the process. The people are still in the process of getting new TVs. And we're already getting in our face 4K. And we're already seeing 4K TVs uh, in the stores. And the 4K standard was established officially, um, I believe, somewhere last fall so uh, until last fall there was still no official 4k standard so we weren't sure what was going to be adopted now we know that their standard is officially but the thing is having so many pixels on a screen does it really make that much of a difference because we're getting into a point where 1080 and 1920 is pretty good and we see it also because when you ask people what do you think of your hd tv they all say it's pretty good because we see the difference between what was TV before standard de de definition and HD 
today. But it's not as clear when we go from HD to Ultra HD 4K. Because, yes, there is an improvement. Anybody that's really uh, keen to look at improvements and details will say, oh, yeah, yeah, there's improvement. But we see also that for the majority of people, their standard HD right now is pretty much OK. And they don't really need more. And of course, this also relies on the fact that we're still using uh, LCD, liquid crystal displays, which is dominant right now. And we are using LED technology. For people that wonder what is LED technology when we're buying a LED TV, it simply has to do with the lighting. The lighting on the side here on this TV is LED. So it's LEDs that basically light up the screen. There's talk about OLEDs in technology. Uh, OLEDs, an example of OLED I'm going to give you here. So this is an OLED display. This is a super, super AMOLED display. What is OLED? The difference here on this TV, the LEDs are on the side. They light up the liquid crystals. Here is a different technology. It's each pixel is an organic LED. So each pixel lights up on its own on this display. That's why they can do this. You see here, I have the time, the calendar. It's an always on display and it actually works well and doesn't take a lot of power. Why? Because before to do this, you had to, dis to have LEDs on the side of the phone that were giving light to the display, the full display, even when it's black. So here, my LED TV, actually, the black you see around here is only black because the electric currents around it say to the uh, liquid crystals, just display in such a manner that it looks dark. Here, it's each little pixel that is actually giving out light. So that is something also that's coming to TVs because we're starting to see OLED TVs, but they're dreadfully expensive. Once again, it's a technology that's brand new. It takes a lot less power. So OLED TVs will eventually be probably a standard eventually. You know, when I'm stepping next to this TV and I'm close, like right here, I feel the heat coming out of the screen. Well, OLEDs will change that because they take so much less energy that probably the TVs will be cool, 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 and run cool instead of running hot like today. So that's another type of technology that's going to come to the computer screen. Anything else? We don't know yet. I haven't seen any other technologies in the way that we display. So Ultra 4, Ultra HD 4K, uh, next standard. But you know, when will that really catch on? We have a few, um, a few companies that say they're going to make some uh, content. Uh, we have YouTube that has said that they will have uh, Ultra HD or 4K content. Netflix says they will have a little bit of 4K. Uh, stuff so ultra HD stuff uh, basically the thing is I was talking about the amount of information so a little earlier I told you to go from standard definition to HD we had to understand how a signal would be much bigger now one of the things that happens with the signal that everybody no actually most people don't know is that if you watch HD TV with rabbit ears over the air, the image is actually better than what you watch on your cable network. And the reason is, 
I told you that this takes more space to be broadcast. So what do you do when you have more space, when you need more space, but you don't have it? You compress, so you zip, you wind zip the signal so that it takes a little less space, but it still looks good. And you can see that compression. When you look at movies through uh, the cable, you'll often see in the dark backgrounds when it's uh, like really, really uh, degrading slowly from say uh, very bright to dark, you'll see that it's kind of pixelated. And that has everything to do with the compression used. Um, where I see compression a lot is on Netflix because it transmits over the internet. It needs to lower the amount of data that it's sending out. So imagine if they're compressing here, how heavily they will compress this, which is huge compared to this. So lots more information. So before we really get a lot of 4K content, lots of things are gonna change. First, once again, TV studios will need to get new 4K cameras, uh, 4K transmitters. Us will have to buy 4K TVs. We'll need also to have the infrastructure sending out 4K signals through the internet, through cable. It's gonna take more space. More data is gonna be sent out. We'll need faster internet connections. We'll need much better infrastructure than now. And of course, as we're not even there yet, as we're not, you're barely going into Ultra HD, of course we have 8K UHD TV. So this is like Ultra Ultra HD and 4K was 3840 by 2160, 8K 7680 by 4320. And of course, that's still in the distant future. Uh, 8K standard is not set yet, but it shows you how the future of our TVs. And one of the things that's gonna be interesting is, this is like retina display on the Mac. You got a retina display. But the thing is, honestly, you know, even here, that Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy phone I got here, has so much pixels packed in here that for the human eye, it's impossible to detect and make a difference. And the same thing happens with when you're here, 4K and 8K. The number of pixels on your screen, with the human eye, you will not be able to see a difference here. I don't think so. And I, it's something where you're wondering where we're going maybe into something that's more like a marketing uh, thing. Companies that want to sell TVs. You know, you'll be happy to say, hey, I've got an 8K TV. You know, I've got an HD TV here and I'm really happy with it. But you know, you'll go to your friend's house and you're gonna say, hey, I've got an 8K TV, brand new. Look how cool it looks. But frankly, I don't think anyone will see unless the display is huge because one of the advantage of 4K and 8K, get yourself a very, very big display. Yes, it will show. Because if you take full HD, put it on a 200 inch screen, you'll have a nice quality. But take 4K on a 200 inch screen, it's gonna be much better. There you'll see it. But on a 50 inch screen like this, you won't be able to see the difference between 4K and 8K, and you'll probably barely, barely see the difference between 4K and Full HD, because we're getting to the limits of what our eyes can distinguish, basically. So, hey, this was a uh, quick, but an interesting look into where TV comes from and where it's going to. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, if you have any, any type of subject for Learn the Tech that you want me to uh, add or talk about, just let me know, as we will, of course, um, check it out. Next week, 
we will take a look at a computer um, peripherals history of all sorts of computer peripherals and I mean by that things that are connected to your computer from the outside mouse printers and all sorts of weird devices over the years that were invented and so we're going to take a look at the technologies that were invented to interface with your computer uh, from the beginnings of computers up to today uh, you know gaming controls uh, wireless keyboard and mice stuff like that and uh, you'll see some weird stuff that you didn't even know existed that could plug into a computer to very very regular stuff like keyboards mouse earphones and uh, all sorts of little gizmos so hope you enjoyed this learn the tech show uh, remember it's a show where you choose the subject so let me know what you want to see on this show on this one hour show we're every tuesdays at 6 p.m eastern time so hey we finished a full day's shows learn the tech and uh, your questions in the live show so let's hope that you enjoy see you next week remember every tuesdays 3 p.m eastern time 1900 hours utc we answer your questions about technology any questions pc mac iphones anything and at 6 p.m., we have Learn the Tech, one hour where we talk about a tech subject. So anything, and I mean anything technological. So uh, we'll have a few shows that are going to be interesting. We'll have uh, uh, next week the gizmos, these peripherals of the computer. And in two weeks, it's going to be about electronics, the start of the electronic era and revolution uh, from tubes to transistors, chips, and all the electronics around it, capacitors and everything. All of that is put together and used in the technologies that we use every day. That will be in two weeks. So take care, everyone. And remember, if you love the shows, please, PayPal donation helps me a lot, uh, helps me do these shows, helps me continue, because I love doing these shows for you guys and girls out there. And uh, if you enjoy what I do, any little bit helps. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Have a nice week. Stay safe. See you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.